Welcome everyone. This is Rob Sanders from Simply Learn and today we're going to talk about SEO tutorial for beginners. So let's get right to it. And in this uh, recording, we're going to talk about a lot of topics related to SEO. So what's in it for you? We're going to start with why SEO? What is SEO? We're going to talk about keyword research. How does a search engine work? Then we're going to go into on-page and off-page SEO and techniques and tactics related to both of those. We're going to dive into how Google algorithms work, the types of SEO, website architecture, local SEO, how to measure your SEO performance, i.e. analytics, and then we're going to have a little quiz at the end. So a lot of information in today's tutorial. So let's get right to it and start with why SEO. And some of you with a website, maybe you're bloggers, maybe you just have a website with a lot of content, have probably had this conversation before where you said, hey, look, I got all this content, but I can't be found on Google search engines. And the first reaction somebody might have is, well, why don't you optimize your website for SEO? And some of you may know what SEO is, some of you may not know what SEO is. And the natural question would be, why does my website need SEO? What is SEO? Well, there are a lot of inherent benefits to SEO, which stands for search engine optimization. And the first benefit is it increases visibility on search engines. So all the techniques we're going to cover today in today's SEO tutorial are going to be techniques to boost your visibility on the search engines. So we're not just talking about Google per se, we're also talking about Bing and Yahoo and Baidu and some of the other search engines that are out there. So that's inherently the first benefit to doing search engine optimization is we want to increase our visibility on search engines. And today's tutorial is going to cover that. The second benefit is it will rank, help you rank higher for relevant keywords. So the idea behind search engines is we want our websites to be found our pages on our websites to be found when somebody does a search. And so ideally, when somebody does a search, you want to be found for the keyword queries that are most relevant to your business. So we want those keyword queries to match the content that we have on our website. And so that's a benefit. We want to be found for what people are looking for. And so that's the beauty of SEO is that your content could be found for those relevant keywords. The third benefit is it helps to increase traffic to your website. So the idea here is a lot of people go to search engines on a daily basis around the world. Depending on what search engine they use, Google is one of the most popular, but if you look at China, Baidu is a popular search engine. Nonetheless, what's common around the world is people do use search engines to find information. And so what we want to do is we want to be found in search engines because that's what people use to find content. And so if we're found on search engines. People are going to find us for relevant keywords. And if they see our content is relevant in the search engine results, after they query a keyword, then they're going to click on our link and go to our website. So if you can imagine all that content you have on your website and all that content is able to be found on the search engines and a lot of people are using search engines with relevant keywords, then naturally you're going to get clicks that's going to drive traffic to your website. And so that's in summary how it works and that's what we want. We want to increase traffic to our website from search engines because that's what people use. And then inherently because of that, it will help people find our website. So an optimized site helps your target audience find your website, increase brand awareness. So that's the idea. If we can drive traffic to our website from search engines and multiple traffic, sometimes from the same users, it's going to naturally also increase our brand awareness. People are going to know more about us if we're found in the search engines. And then another benefit here is it helps to convert a local business into a global business. What we mean by that is if we're found in the search engine results, if somebody types in a relevant keyword and our content shows up in the search engine results on Google or Baidu or Bing or any search engine, ideally, our business can be found all over the world. Our content can be found all over the world. It's not necessarily local per se. We may have a local business in a particular city or locale, 
but that doesn't stop anybody from around the world from finding our content. So the idea behind search engines is, look, the content's available to anyone around the world. And to me, this is one of the biggest benefits because it can boost traffic, it can boost brand awareness, it can boost traffic. And the whole idea is taking your business and taking it and elevating it to more of a global brand versus just a local brand. And so that inherently is one of the key benefits to search engine optimization. So let's move on to what is SEO. Uh, we're going to uh, talk about SEO and how do you define it. So SEO again stands for search engine optimization. It's basically the practice of getting traffic from the organic search results on not just Google, but really any search engine. So depending on the keyword that somebody types in, regardless of what search engine they use, that search engine is going to rank websites based on the relevancy of the keyword. So if you have a website and you uh, have a blog and you have a lot of content and you're a food blogger and you write about, let's just say, restaurants and you're doing restaurant reviews and you happen to be doing a restaurant review about Italian restaurants, well, if somebody typed in Italian restaurants, you may want to come up for that keyword. Okay, so it's all about relevancy. Does that search engine see that particular blog post as the most relevant for that search query? So that's what SEO is all about. We want to be able to rank our websites for certain keywords on search engines. So if our website is ranked on search engines, then there's a lot of benefits to that. Uh, we talked about those benefits in the why SEO, but the biggest benefit is the visibility that comes with that. So the higher you're ranked on a search engine, the more traffic you're going to get. And it's a snowball effect because the more traffic you get, the more conversions you're going to get. So here you can see the percentage of Google traffic, the higher you rank. So generally there are 10 results per page on a search engine. So if you're ranked in the top three or even in the first or second position, you're going to get a majority of the clicks. And search engine optimization starts with the keyword because we want to be found for relevant keywords. And so the first step in search engine optimization is always going to be keyword research. So it is the most important step. And so what is keyword research all about? Well, it's the process of identifying keywords we want to be found for on the search engines. So millions of people use search engines on a daily basis. We want to be found for those keywords that people type in that are relevant to the content we want to be found. So going back to the Italian restaurant example, if we're writing a blog post about Italian restaurants, if somebody types in the best Italian restaurants or Italian restaurants in a specific city, we want to be found for that content if it's relevant to what we wrote about. So keyword research should be done based on two factors, really. It's based on the factor of how much traffic or volume a particular search engine query has, and it's based on competition. And really, the underlying factor here is that all keywords in your keyword research should be relevant. So you need to understand what those keywords are. So are they relevant to the content that you want to be found for? If they are, then really the two factors you want to look for is the volume, how much volume or traffic each keyword has associated with it, and then the competition. How many other websites are trying to be found for the same keyword? So those are the factors involved with keyword research. You always want to choose relevant keywords, and then once you find or choose those relevant keywords, you want to be able to find out exactly how much volume and how much competition is associated with each of those keywords. And so when you look at keywords, you're always going to choose relevant keywords. But there are two types of keywords. There are short tail keywords and there are long tail keywords. And we're going to talk about both of these here. So let's start with short tail keywords. So short tail keywords are generic keywords. Generally, they're less than three words in a keyword phrase. For example, Italian restaurants. So short tail keywords generally have very high search volume. That means that if somebody types in Italian restaurants, then there's going to be a large amount of volume with that, meaning that generally a lot of people type in the keyword Italian restaurants. However, with high volume always comes high competition. 
So if you want to be found for Italian restaurants, know that if you are ranked number one or number two or even on page one of Google, you're going to get a lot of traffic. However, to get to page one of Google or even position one or two, it's going to take you a while because there are probably a lot of websites who are in front of you who want to be ranked and found for the same keyword. So the whole idea with short tail keywords is it's a lot of visibility, it's a lot of traffic, a lot of volume, but also a lot of competition. And generally the underlying factor here is that if you are ranked for a very broad or short tail keyword like Italian restaurants, then chances are it's not going to be as relevant. So if you get the traffic to your website, then chances are the conversion's not necessarily going to happen because we don't necessarily know the mindset of somebody typing in a very short tail generic keyword like Italian restaurants. They could be doing research on Italian restaurants. They could be a chef who's trying to get recipes for Italian food. It could be a tourist looking for Italian restaurants in a different city. Or it could be a person just looking for Italian restaurants near their location or where they're living. And so there's a lot of different factors with short tail keywords. So you just don't know because it's so generic. And because it's so generic, if you do get the traffic for that generic keyword, then the chances of the conversion are going to be lower than, say, if it's a more specific, relevant keyword. So let's take an example of a short tail keyword. Let's just stick with Italian restaurants. So I'm going to go to a tool called Moz. And well, Moz has a tool called the Keyword Explorer. And within Moz, so if you go to moz.com and then use their Keyword Explorer, you can get an idea of how much volume and competition are associated with a particular keyword. So in this example, we're using Italian restaurants. It's a very broad keyword. We could see that the monthly volume is between 70,000 and 118,000 per month. Okay, so that means for a particular keyword in the United States on a search engine, you're going to get about 70,000 to 118,000 people who type in that keyword. And so if we were to look at the difficulty of that keyword, you could see that it's fairly difficult because out of 1 to 100, it's got a score of 43. So it's fairly difficult. However, if you notice, the click-through rate's very high. So Moz estimates that we'll have a 40% organic click-through rate for that keyword if we're ranked for it. So if it's relevant to us and we want to get some visibility to our site, then yeah, we want to use that generic short tail keyword. However, if we're interested in conversions, then we really want to turn our attention to longer tail keywords. However, if you want the visibility, then you want to use short tail keywords. If you want the conversion, then you want to switch over to longer tail keywords. So longer tail keywords are more specific. They usually consist of more than three keywords. So Italian restaurants, very generic. If we add a few more keywords, that keyword phrase, it then becomes longer tail. So compared to short tail keywords, longer tail keywords are generally less competitive and the search volume is not as high. Case in point, so if we go back to Moz and then we look at the Keyword Explorer and we'd actually type in Italian restaurants and let's just say Orlando, Florida. Moz is going to generate some monthly volume for us and they're going to allow us to understand how difficult that keyword is. And so here you could see very, very little search volume. In fact, so little volume, there's 11 to 50. Okay, so that means on average that this keyword generates 11 to 50 queries a month. So very low compared to our short tail keyword, Italian restaurants. The difficulty here didn't necessarily lessen, but it is less uh, competitive. So if you're interested in conversions and you have an Italian restaurant in say Orlando, Florida, then this is the keyword you may want to use. So there's a trade-off between longer tail and shorter tail. But when visitors land from longer tail keywords, they're usually ready to make a purchase. They're usually more specific intent there's more intent involved with a longer tail keyword. 
So best restaurants in, Italian, in Florida, branded shoes in Florida, something very specific is going to generate probably a higher conversion rate than something more generic. So that's the trade-off. And so when to use long tail keywords? Well, we wanna use long tail keywords if we're targeting pages with a product or specific article. So if we're interested in that particular conversion, then longer tail keywords are likely more the way we wanna go versus something more generic which means if you're using a generic shorter tail keyword, you're more interested in the visibility and the traffic, not necessarily the conversion. How does a search engine work? So let's talk about that for a minute. So we know that millions of people use search engines. We know that we wanna be found on search engines, but how do we actually get our content in the search engine? So that's the important part that we need to understand if we have our own website and we have our content. So these search engines want your content in their search engine index. So how do they get your content? Well, they send out bots or files and we'll just call them spiders. So they send out these spiders to crawl your website. And the whole idea behind using the insect spider is because we're talking about the World Wide Web. And so if Google, for example, sends a bot to your website, they're gonna crawl your website and spider your website. They're creating a web of pages. So all they're doing is following link. And every page and link that they hit, they're going to bring back to their server. So these spiders scan your websites, they just follow links, and they take all the pages and content that they're able to gather when they hit your website, and they're gonna pull all that information back into their own index. So if you think about Google, they're crawling or spidering millions and billions of websites. All those millions and billions of websites are sitting on Google servers. So when somebody does do a search query, Google, because they have all these websites in their index, are able to quickly determine which website is the most relevant for that search engine query. So that's generally how search engines work. So let's talk about the types of SEO. So if we want our website to be found on these search engines and Google or these search engines have crawled our website, then what we wanna do is we want to basically look at it from a two-pronged perspective. It's a two-pronged strategy. So the first strategy we're gonna talk about today is on-page SEO. So those are, on-page SEO is defined as what we do on our website to be relevant for search engine query on a search engine. So again, on-page SEO is what we do to our own website. Off-page SEO is the other, the second part of that SEO strategy. And off-page SEO determines what we do off our website to be relevant for search engine query. And so off-page SEO generally is synonymous with link building. And we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go forward, but really when you want to do SEO, when you want to be found for a, a keyword on a search engine, you're going to have to apply both on-page SEO and off-page SEO. So let's talk about on-page SEO. And so this is the first part of our SEO effort. We wanna focus on on-page SEO first. And so on-page SEO is the method of optimizing elements of web pages. Remember, these are all the items we want to do on our website to be relevant for certain search queries. So it's basically, the idea behind this is to make our web pages more relevant for specific search queries on search engines. And so there are a number of different elements on our website, on a particular web page that we want to manipulate or optimize, if you will, to be relevant for a search engine query. And so let's start around the idea that you know, you, there's a number of things you can do. So let's start with schema first. And so schema is nothing more than, it's a collaborative effort between Bing, Yahoo, Baidu, Google. And the idea is really, they wanna understand more about the content of your website. And so the idea behind this is that you want to be able to provide snippets of information to these search engines so they understand a little bit more about what your web page is trying to portray or convey so that they can find out exactly what's relevant to that search engine query. So it's nothing more than micro data or bits of information that you can add to your website or web page 
in order to provide a little bit more enhanced information to the search engines. So if you think about it, it's collaborating with the search engine. So the more basic information you share with the search engines, the, the better off they have to understand what your web page or website is all about. And so the more information they have, the better of an opportunity you have to be ranked for that search engine query. And so if you have a website with reviews, if you have a website with images, if you have, let's say, a website with products with prices, in other words, you have an e-commerce website and you're trying to sell products. Well, to me, you want to employ schema because again, schema is snippets of information that are provided to the search engine so they can better understand. So you can certainly provide snippets of information in the terms of images or prices or particular products and how much is left in stock. So all this information, these bits of information you can provide to the search engine so that they can better understand what it is you're trying to sell, how much it costs, how much is in inventory, what people think about the product, etc. So if you have a website that sells products, you probably want to employ schema. And so when you do employ schema, Again, snippets of information provided to the search engines. The search engines are gonna better understand and then they're gonna present that information in the search engine results. So if you have ratings and reviews, you can provide snippets of information to the search engines. The search engines in turn are gonna present that information in the search engine results. So if you have positive reviews, then somebody typing in, in this example, shoes, they're gonna be able to see that you have positive reviews for your website. So that's the whole idea behind schema, is to provide snippets of information. So again, it's not just related to reviews, also for images. So if you have images, you can provide snippets of information to the search engine so they can see you know, what the shoe actually looks like when they type in, in this example, Puma shoes. Or like I mentioned, inventory. Snippets of information about your inventory. The search engines are gonna provide that information in search engine results. So if somebody's looking for women's training shoes or women's Puma shoes and they see your product and they see, oh, this is in stock, Great, let me go to this website and purchase these shoes. So that's the whole idea behind schema is making sure you present information critical to your website so that the search engines better understand what your website's all about. It also helps with relevancy because the more those search engines know about your website, the more relevant your website becomes and the better chance you have to rank for a particular keyword. There's also some other information here involved with schema and those are site links. So site links, additional pages on your website, okay, that show up in the search engine result. And so again, the more information a search engine has about you, the better chance you have to be found, the better chance you have to get a click. So site links are just additional links on your site that appear in search engine results. And that's all a benefactor of having schema. So here you can see in this example, we have additional web pages that show under a certain search engine result. And so by having more links in the search engine results, you have a better chance of getting the click. So if you want more information about schema, I would recommend going to schema.org. So when you go to uh, schema.org, you can actually click on a link that allows you to see all the information you need to get started with schema.org. Okay, so it's got a lot of information available to you. It describes what it is you have to do in order to get your information and uh, set for the search engines to better understand. Focus on for on-page SEO is title tag. And so title tag is what shows up in the search engine results. So if you've ever done a search engine query, meaning you've gone to Google, typed in a query using a keyword like Italian restaurants, you're gonna see specific search engine results. And the title tag is what appears in those search engine results. So a title tag is important because it's the title of a web page that appears in those results. And so the title tag is something that's important because if we want to be found for a specific keyword, we want to make sure that keyword is in the title tag because that keyword's going to describe what the page is all about. 
And so if we want to be found for that keyword, let's just say Italian restaurants in Florida, for example, that's going to be part of our title tag. So when somebody types in that particular keyword query, Italian restaurants in Florida, then we have a good chance of showing up because the title tag, which is the title of the page, is going to have that particular query in it. And so you can edit the title tag and when you edit the title tag, you want to be able to put that particular keyword in the title tag. So if we do a search on Google, for example, so if I go to google.com and I type in Italian restaurants in Florida, here I can see under the local search results, and here I can see Italian restaurants in Florida, Central Florida, Italian restaurants in Miami. So you can see that these are highlighted. So the title tag is not only stands out, but allows you to you know, showcase exactly what your page is all about and it helps with the relevancy of that keyword query. So when you're trying to optimize your website using the title tag for a specific keyword, you wanna keep in mind a couple parameters because title tags show up in the search engine results, but certain search engines, particularly Google, has character limits around the number of characters you can use in the title tag. And so we want to keep that in mind. So ideally, we want to format our title tag appropriately. And so to me, the most optimal way to optimize a title tag using a particular keyword that you want to be found for is to use that keyword in the title tag and then separate that with your brand name. So if you actually have two keywords, then you can use the primary keyword first, then the secondary keyword, and then the brand name. So to me, this is the most optimal format, but keep in mind there are character limits. But if you look at this format, to me, it's the most easiest format to abide by because it makes your title tag more relevant. You don't have to worry about necessarily fitting in excess keywords in the title tag because again, the title tag has character limits. So if we take a look at our example in Google search results, if you go over those limits, and the title tag is generally between 60 and 65 characters long. And so if you go over those limits, let's just say your title tag is more than 65 characters, Google in this case is going to cut off the characters. And so here you can see the ellipses after the title tag. Now, if you follow the format that you know, we at Simply Learn recommend, you could see if our keyword is Italian restaurants in Florida, and then separated by the brand name, this gives you an optimal format for the title tag. It also makes it relevant for the keyword query. So you want to keep that title tag probably no more than 60 characters because if you flirt with putting more than 60 characters, then the search engines are going to cut off that title tag and then that's not going to look good and it's going to also become less relevant. So we want to keep the character counts in mind. So if you abide by that format of the keyword and then maybe the secondary keyword if you have one separated by the brand name, then you should be good to go with making sure your title tag is relevant for that keyword query. So let's then turn our attention to the meta description. So the meta description is just a short description about the content on your web page. So if the title tag is the title of the web page, the meta description describes the page. Okay, so it's a description about what that page is. So the meta description appears under the title tag and then the URL. So if we go back to our Google search results, we look here, Italian restaurants in Florida, Maggiano's Little Italy is the brand or the restaurant. We can see the URL, which is underneath the title tag. And then here we could see the meta description. And so with the meta description, you have a little bit more room to work with in terms of character count. But the meta description, just like the title tag, is just as important because one, it shows up in the search engine results. Two, it describes what the page is all about. And three, it allows you to optimize the meta description. So the meta description becomes more relevant for that search query that somebody types into that particular search engine. So the optimal length 
for a meta description. You can go up to 300 characters, but I would not even recommend even flirting with that limit because just like the title tag, search engines, in the case of Google, will actually cut off the meta description. So if we look here back at our search results, if you go over those limits, you'll see that the search engines will cut off the copy of the meta description with and they'll just put ellipses so we don't necessarily want to go over those limits so my recommendation is to keep that meta description probably 165 characters to two no more than 200 because we're trying to describe not only what the page is all about, but we're also trying to optimize that meta description so it becomes relevant for the search engine query. And so you wanna keep it short and concise. So if we look at our example here, Italian restaurants in Florida, Maggiano's does a good job. So book an event space, make a reservation at Maggiano's in Florida to enjoy delicious view maps, menus, and more. So we're very concise. Meta description, it includes their keyword query that they wanna be found for, Italian restaurants in Florida. And so to me, it's short and concise, describes what the page is all about, and uh, allows them to fit it all in within the character limits. So here, in this example, we wanna be found for Amazon Puma Shoes. So the brand here is Amazon. So Amazon wants to include you know, Puma shoes, not only in the title tag, but they wanna try and fit that into the meta description. However, the whole idea behind the meta description, more than anything else, is describe what the page is all about. Okay, you want to be relevant for the search engine query, but you also want to sound natural as well. You want to be able to, really, the whole idea between the title tag and the meta description is to get people to click on on your link because remember there are nine other listings on the Google search engine results page for page one so we want our meta description and our title tag to stand out so we want it to be relevant but we want it to stand out so it's important you write that meta description according to what the page is all about but you want it to stand out uniquely and accordingly so once you've done the title tag and the meta description, you wanna focus your attention on the header tag. And so header tags are used on a web page to really separate out content. And so you have headers and subheaders. And so ideally, you want to be able to optimize the header tag and the subheader. And so if we think about headers, there's a hierarchy for headers. So there's between a header one and a header six. And so we'll just shorten the word header and we'll call it an H1. So H1 is really at the top of the hierarchy for headers. And so if we use a H1 on our web page, then what we're trying to explain to the search engines is listen, this particular keyword phrase in our header is, is a header and we're, we're trying to emphasize what it is we're trying to say. And that's how really the search engines interpret headers. They see an H1, H2, H3, H4, H5, and H6. They know that if you're using an H1, you're trying to really emphasize something. So if you put that keyword in the header tag, what you're telling the search engines is, hey, I'm really emphasizing this particular keyword. And so the search engine will interpret that as important. And if you use your keyword in that header, then really what you're saying is, hey, I really, this keyword is really relevant to that query. So naturally, the other benefit of a header is it really breaks up the page as well. So the header, you can use subheaders and subheaders are nothing more than say a lower H tag. So if you have a header that's an H1, you can use an H2 or an H3 as a subheader and so forth and so on because what you're really trying to do is not only organize the content in your web page but you're trying to emphasize that for google so if something's an h2 or an h6 you're basically telling google or the other search engines this is not as important as say an h1 so if we take a look at our example that we've been using for italian restaurants in florida and if we click on maggiana's we could see that they're using headers. So if we click on Maggiano's, we could see that this is a header here. We wanna bring everyone together at Maggiano's Italian restaurant in Florida. So they're using that header to break up the text. Here you can see they're using another header here, excellent Italian food and an excellent experience to match. So that's a header to break up the content. Okay, they're not using subheaders, they're just using headers, but that's fine. They're really trying to emphasize 
the content by putting in that header. And so headers help not only organize the content, but they help emphasize the actual keyword it is you want Google to recognize. So if we're not sure if something is a header, we could simply just mouse over what we think is a header and we can just right click. And if you right click on something, you're gonna see a menu. And if we click inspect element, then basically what that browser, in this case Firefox, is going to do is, is show us the HTML of that particular thing, of that item that we right clicked. So here we could see, in this particular case, this is an H2 tag. So it's an H2, so if we scroll down and we mouse over this, we could see this is also an H2 as well. So this particular page is using H2 tags, not H1, but an H2. So what they're explaining or trying to convey to the search engines is, listen, this is an H2, it's still relevant. We're still trying to put emphasis on it, but not as much. So we want to be able to use our H1s and our H2s accordingly. So remember an H1 is you're providing the search engines with information by telling them, hey, this is the most relevant. This is we're putting emphasis on this keyword. An H2, not as much as an H1. And an H3, not as much as an H2. So use your headers accordingly. Uh, not only to, to break up the text, not only for styling, but for emphasis for the search engines. So headers are very important elements for on-page SEO. Okay, let's turn our attention to the URL structure. Okay, so URL stands for Uniform Resource Locator. And so our URL is the specific location of a web page on the internet. So basically, if we're found in the search engine results, one of our web pages are going to go along with the title tag and the meta description in the search engine results page. So if I go back to our search engine results for Italian restaurants in Florida, we could see that the particular URL in question here is locations.magianos.com slash Florida. So that's the URL that shows up along with the title tag and the meta description. So if we click on that link, that's exactly where we're going to go. So URL structure is important for on-page SEO. So why is it important? Because not only does it show people where they're going, but we have an opportunity to optimize that URL for the search engines to make our URL more relevant for that search query. So just like the title tag, just like the meta description, just like the headers, we can also manipulate the URL. So if we look at a URL, it consists of really the protocol, and the protocol means it's either a secure site or non-secure site. So in this example, we could see it's HTTPS, and that means it's a secure site. And so ideally, search engines like web pages or websites that are secure. So after the protocol, you're gonna see the domain, and then after the domain, you're gonna see subdirectories. Okay, so that's generally the breakout with URL structures. You have the protocol, the domain, and subdirectories, and then you may have more subdirectories. So if we go back to the example we've been working with, if I go back to Magianos, you could see here, this is a secure site, HTTPS. You could see the domain. In this case, it's actually a subdomain. So Magianos.com is the domain, but they decided to put locations.magianos.com. And that's okay, we call that a subdomain. And then here you could see they have one particular subdirectory after the domain, and that's Florida. So a well-structured URL not only provides the users with information about where they're going when they click on your link in the search engine results, but more importantly, it also provides the search engines and some information about what the web page is all about. So going back to our simple example with Magianos, the search engines know that, hey, if somebody clicks on this link, they're going to a page about Florida. Pretty simple. The URL structure is pretty simple to understand. We know it's a secure site. We know it's Magianos.com. And we know the subpage is Florida, or the subdirectory is Florida. You want to be careful, like everything else in, in SEO, there are parameters. Just like the title tag has parameters up to 65 characters, the meta description tag has a limit of up to 165 characters. A well-structured URL also has character counts. But the idea here is we don't want to get into numbers when we talk about character counts for URL structure. Really, the rule of thumb or the best practice for URL is to keep it short, 
and understandable, okay? If we keep it clear and concise, not only does the end user know where they're going, but the search engines know what the page is all about. So the rule of thumb is always, if you don't understand the URL or what it means, then the search engines are likely not gonna understand what the URL means. We wanna keep the number of directories and subdirectories to a limit. So ideally here, you could see in this example, xyz.com, if we wanna optimize that URL, we could put the targeted keyword in the URL if we'd like to, but we wanna keep it probably to a minimum of one to two subdirectories. The shorter the, the amount of subdirectories, the better off we are, because that means that not only the end user will understand the URL, but the search engines will understand the URL as well. So we always wanna make sure that URL is readable, again, for the end user and the search engine. And so in this example, you could see amazon.com slash men's dash shoes slash sneakers slash Puma. Very easy to understand. As an end user, I know that I'm going to a Puma page uh, for men on amazon.com. Now, when you get into URLs with dynamic parameters in them, then ideally you as an end user is not gonna really know where you're going to go. So in the example here, the middle example, I can see that I'm going maybe to a shoes page, but I have no idea what the rest of that URL means. And in the other example where you have a very low URL readability, I have no idea as an end user where I'm going to go. So as an end user, I need to be able to have confidence in knowing where I'm gonna go once I click on a link in the search engine results. So if I don't have that confidence, if I don't understand what the URL is, then the, U then the search engines aren't going to understand as well and it's not gonna bode well in terms of relevancy. And again, the URL structure is an important factor for being relevant. And if we're not relevant, then the chances of us are ranking higher is not gonna be as good because our URL is not readable. So ideally what we wanna do is make sure we're using keywords that the end user and the search engines understand. And if we need to separate out those keywords, in the first example we could see men's shoes, we wanna separate that out with a hyphen. And so ideally, if you have a URL that's readable and it's short, and concise, then again, your chances of ranking higher on the search engine results page bodes better than if you have a very long, antiquated, unreadable URL. So let's focus our attention on image alt text or alt tags, if you will. So alt tags or text tags, as they're also known as, allow uh, the search engine to understand a little bit more about what's on the page in terms of images. So images are a prominent part of every web page on the internet. Unfortunately, images are you know, usually files that are not readable by search engines. So we want to be able to provide some alternate text so that the search engines understand what those images are all about. So again, it gives us an opportunity to communicate with the search engines so that they better understand what the image is all about to make the page more relevant. So generally, if an image fails to load on a web page, as an example, well, if you have an alt tag, then the alt tag is going to show in place of the image not loading. More importantly, if we have an alt tag and the search engines have spidered our website, and somebody's actually searching for images, then the alt tag is used as a descriptor for the image. So it also helps us get found for the images on search engine results pages. And so like everything else we've talked about with on-page SEO, there are character limits to alt tags. You know, generally the rule of thumb is 125 characters for an alt tag. And the alt tag is used in the HTML. So we wanna surround our image with an alt tag by putting in a descriptor. And so ideally, if you're trying to be found for a particular search engine query, then you wanna use the search engine query as part of the alt tag. And so let me show you an example here, going back to Magianos. We look at their web page and we actually inspect one of their images on this web page. If we look at, uh, for example, uh, Pinterest or or Facebook, we can actually see in this example that the image here 
has an alt tag it's pinterest and so you want to be able again to put in alt tags for all your images so it better communicates with the search engines what the image is all about it also allows the search engines to rank images in the search engine results based on that alt text and what the keyword query was so alt tags play an important role because again if the image doesn't load on the web page for some reason then the alt tag is there as a replacement it's also there to help the search engines rank those images and understand the page a little bit better so you always want to be able to put in the keyword query that you're trying to be found for in the alt tag and so be as descriptive as possible you have 125 characters to use so be as descriptive make it easy to read because again this is what's going to show up in the search engine results pages for images okay let's turn our attention to internal links so when it comes to seo internal links also play a vital role because basically an internal link which is a link from one page of your website to another page of your website, um, allows Google to, or other search engines really, to follow the pages as they index your entire website. So it serves that purpose of allowing search engines to index. So it definitely improves the indexing. But internal linking also has many benefits. And one of the other benefits is it helps spread what we call link juice. And so link juice is basically a way, another way of saying, you know, this page is important because it has links from other pages on our website. So if we link, uh, have a link from one page to another and a couple of other pages on our site link to that same page, then search engines tend to take notice and they tend to note that you know, if one particular page has a number of different links pointing to it, then this page may be important. And so that's what we mean by link juice. It's a signal for the search engine to determine what pages on your website are important because of the links that point to it. And so if we look at this example here, we could see that, you know, there's usually a navigation on a website that point to pages. And every page on a website tends to have a link but if more than one page has multiple links then again that signals to the search engines that hey you know this particular page seems to be important because it has a lot of links pointing to it our attention to sitemaps so sitemaps basically allow us to list all the web pages on our website so we could do that in a couple of different ways but when we do it, it basically is going to help the search engines find our pages easier. Just as I mentioned a minute ago about internal linking, when you have one link pointing to another page on your website, it helps the search engines find these pages quicker. Well, sitemaps do the same thing, except sitemaps are an entire list of links on your website, and it allows the site search engines to find all your pages on your website fairly easily. But it also helps the end user too. So if you have a big website, like Amazon has a huge website with a lot of different products. Well, if you're looking for a particular product, you can do a search for it, or you can look at the sitemap, and the sitemap will list all the particular pages on the site. And so it's also good for the end user as well. So when we talk about the end user and we talk about search engines, there are really two different types of sitemaps. You got the HTML version, which is for the end user. That's gonna be nothing more than a link on the website, usually in the footer. And so when you click on that sitemap link, you'll get a list of all the links on the website. Okay, so that's an HTML sitemap. Then we have the sitemap for the search engines, you know, the spiders that want to crawl our site. So that's the XML sitemap, and an XML is just a different format. It's just a way to format all the links on our website. So the HTML sitemap is HTML written in hypertext markup language, designed for the end user. If you click on it, it helps the end user navigate the website quickly because they can find what they're looking for. And so generally, 
that is an HTML. Now, if we turn our attention to the XML sitemap, that's basically designed for search engines. And the thing about the search, uh, the XML sitemap is we work with Google to go ahead and, and, and submit the sitemap to Google so Google can quickly understand what pages on our website. So for example, if I went to a website, let's just say valleyfig.com. So if I went here and if I'm a search engine, I'm gonna to wanna to know all the URLs that are on this website. Well, as an end user, I can also just type in sitemap.xml. Usually that's the XML file where all the URLs are located. And here I could see all of the URLs on valleyfig.com. And so the idea behind an XML sitemap is we wanna communicate that XML file to the search engines. And so Google in particular has what they call a search console. And search console, if you go to google.com slash webmasters, so search console is a way to communicate with Google. And one of the ways to communicate with Google is to submit a sitemap. So we wanna submit our XML sitemap. So if our XML sitemap is located in the root directory, so after our domain, valleyfig.com slash sitemap.xml, we know that that file is sitting in the root directory. I can go into search console and I can submit my sitemap. And when I submit my sitemap, then I'm basically communicating with Google, telling Google, hey, Google, instead of trying to find all our web pages on our website, when you crawl the website, we're gonna go ahead and submit the sitemap to you. So we're gonna tell you all the pages on our website. And so by doing that, by submitting our sitemap.xml file to Google, it speeds up the process because Google's able to now understand all the pages on our website that have been submitted. And then once we submit those pages, then Google's going to quickly index a majority of those pages, if not all of those pages. And so that's the benefit of having an XML sitemap for the search engines, is that we can quickly submit that file to the search engine so our pages get submitted and indexed quicker. So continuing on with on-page SEO, we now turn our attention to page speed. And so page speed, also known as page load time of a particular page of a particular website, is important for SEO. Why is it important? Because Google has millions of users use their search engine and Google wants their users to have a good experience. And so if Google ranks websites based on relevancy, they also wanna take into account page speed because if a website does not load fast or a web page doesn't load fast, then it would be detrimental for Google to rank that page high because what's gonna happen is that page is going to get a number of clicks and then the user experience is not gonna be that great. And so therefore it's gonna have a negative impact, not only in the end user, but Google as well. And so page load time then becomes important for on-page SEO. So really when it comes to page load time, we really wanna pay attention to how long it takes our web pages to load in terms of seconds. Because if a page loads slow, then chances are the user experience is not gonna be good even from an analytics perspective. Meaning if I go to Google, type in a query, click on a link, and then it's, that link takes me to a website where the web page loads very slow, chances are I'm not gonna spend a lot of time waiting for that page to load. I'm going to leave that page. And if I leave the page, then it's gonna cause a, what they call a bounce. So I'm gonna bounce from the page. And that's just not good for the entire search ecosystem. And so we wanna pay close attention to page load time because the faster a site or page loads, Google's going to recognize that and that's going to help with ranking. And so how do we understand how our pages load? Well, we can look no further than web analytics tool like Google Analytics, for example. So if we turn our attention to Google Analytics, if I go to say valleyfig.com's analytics account, I can look over the last 30 days and I can see, okay, on average, our page average page load time for the entire site was five seconds, around five seconds. And ideally, we want our pages load as quick as possible. I would say the rule of thumb on page load time is probably no more than three to four seconds. Okay, but there are factors involved with page load time. So 
A couple of factors are the browser that people use. So some browsers load pages differently than other browsers. The other factor involved with browsers is the device. So you could be on a mobile device and say Internet Explorer versus on a desktop using Chrome. And you're going to have variation in terms of average page load time. So definitely browser device plays a role, but also country plays a role. The infrastructure, how much bandwidth is available. So you could be in, say, San Francisco, United States and be on a high speed network versus another city or another country where you're not necessarily on the same high speed network. You're on a lower bandwidth or lower network and that's going to affect the page load time as well. So in analytics, you can actually see the breakdown of time per country. And then of course the page itself. So when we talk about average page load time for a website, we're talking about the average for the entire site. But we can actually look at, in Google Analytics, the average load time for every page on the site. So ideally, if you have a particular page you wanna rank organically in the search engines and the average page load time is not suitable or it's very high, then you want to address what the issues are. And so the great thing about Google Analytics is you actually have speed suggestions. So if I go to speed suggestions in Google Analytics, I'm gonna be able to see the average load time for certain pages on the site. And then what Google's gonna do is actually give me uh, some feedback. So for example, I can see that the home page loads about 5.59 seconds. And so if I click on page speed suggestions, then Google is going to give me suggestions on how to speed up the page load time, not only on desktop, but on mobile as well. So when you click on page speed suggestions, you're actually gonna go to a tool, a Google tool called PageSpeed Insights. And then PageSpeed Insights is going to allow you to see how quick your page loads, and then it's going to be able to give you feedback on what to do in order to speed up the page load time, not only for the page, but for the site. And the great thing again, is you can see it for desktop and you can see it for mobile. So page speed is important. We wanna be able to keep our, our page load time low, no more than probably again, three to four seconds, because if it's any more than that, Google's gonna take notice, the other search engines are gonna take notice, and they're not gonna to wanna to rank that particular page high on Google. So some ways to increase your page speed, you always wanna optimize your images. You never wanna have images that take a long time to load. You wanna use a simple website design. Now I know Flash, as an example, has long been disbanded, but you don't want to use other technology that's really gonna slow the page load time. Of course, where your website is hosted does matter. So the server it's hosted on could be shared with other websites. And so that may eat into how quick the server responds to people trying to load your web page. And so you wanna keep that in mind. So server response time does play a factor in loading. And then of course, optimizing your code. You wanna never have unnecessary code on your website. And when I say unnecessary code, some examples could be tracking code. If you're doing any search advertising, let's just say on Facebook or Bing, you try to want to minimize the amount of extra code you put on a site because that code has to execute and that eats into the page load time. So you wanna be cognizant of how much code you put on your website because that will eat into the page load time. So let's talk about featured snippets. So featured snippets, is the search result that generally shows uh, up at the top of the search engine organic results. So it's informational content and you'll see it above organic results, but you'll also see it below search advertising. And so some of the common featured snippets you may see are in the form of a paragraph, a table, or a list. And so Paragraph snippets tend to be the most popular. And, and, and let me show you an example of a, a featured snippet. So if I go to say google.com and type in machine learning, here you can see some paid search ads, okay? And why do I know they're paid search ads? Because I can see ad next to them. But if I look below the paid search ads, but above the organic search results, I see a paragraph featured snippet. 
And this is nothing more than, again, just some an informational content about machine learning. And really, the whole idea behind uh, featured snippets is really they're just informational. And really, it's informational. And, and what Google likes to do is pull content in there that really answers a question. So if your content doesn't necessarily answer a question, then you can't expect your content to show up as a featured snippet. So the whole idea is with the search engines is really Google searches through a number of different sites to find content that will best answer a user's question. Like, for example, what is machine learning? OK, so if we ask the question, what is machine learning? We can expect to find a featured snippet. And so really what users do a lot when they type in a query, they use prefixes like how does or how do or how to or what is. And so those types of questions are normally asked as part of the search query. So if you could answer those questions, then generally Google's going to recognize that. And if it's relevant, it's going to show up as a featured snippet. So the whole idea is to really create truly high quality content. So about feature snippets is if you have true high quality content that answers a question, then chances are your content may show up as a featured snippet. So the whole idea is, you know, work to create high quality content that provides a really good answer to really basic question. It could be anything. What is machine learning? What is a fig? You know, how to ride a bicycle? How do I surf? All these are related questions that content can answer. And Google wants to make sure as part of a featured snippet that they provide content that answers that question. And not just content, the best content that does the, the best job with the most relevant information to answer that person's search query. So here we could see our three examples. You have a table format. So if we want to type in aviation jobs, we can see snippets of information about the latest job listings for aviation. You can see in the middle screenshot, what is machine learning? So that's our paragraph featured snippet. And then if you type in something like building a fence, it's going to give you a list of you know ways to go about building a fence. So these are all answers to questions. The query may not necessarily be in question form, but the snippet is there just in case you want to know more information about that particular query. So generally, that's how featured snippets work. And the great thing about featured snippets, it's open to everybody. The key is to have quality content. If you have quality content that provides answers to questions, then chances are your content can show up above organic search results, which will give you more visibility, drive a lot more traffic to your site and quality traffic because likely it's answering somebody's question. So let's do a, a recap of everything we talked about with on-page SEO. So before we move on to off-page, remember on-page SEO is what we do to our website to enhance our website to be found in the search engines for relevant keywords. So it's all about relevancy. And remember, before you do anything to your website, you need to start with the basics of keyword research. You need to find keywords that are highly relevant, that have volume and low competition. And so when you can focus on your keywords and you find out and finalize what keywords you want to be found for, then you're going to conduct on-page SEO. On-page SEO consists of a number of different factors, some of which we talked about today, starting with schema. Remember, we want to have structured data to better communicate with the search engines what our web pages are about. Then we talked about title tags. So title tags appear in search results. Remember 65 characters. We want to make sure our keyword is in the title tag followed by our brand name. And then we talked about meta descriptions. Meta descriptions allow us to, you know, talk specifically about what that page is all about. Meta descriptions fall under the title tag in the search results. We talked about headers h1 through h6 h1 being the biggest in the hierarchy of headers and having an h1 tag with your keyword provides the search engines with an identity of how strong or how important something is on a page 
It also organizes the page with headers and subheaders and it breaks up the content so it's easily understandable by the end user. We also talked about alt tags. So remember images on its own are not recognized by search engines. So we want to surround those images with alt tags, with words that help the search engines identify what that image is. They also serve a purpose in the browser. If an image doesn't load, then we can actually see what the image is all about with the alt tag. We talked about featured snippets. There are lists. Okay. There are paragraphs. Okay, there, there are different types of snippets. And really the whole idea again behind snippets is answering a question with quality content. We talked about page speed, identifying how quick our pages load in Google Analytics. So if your pages don't load very quickly, then Google actually provides suggestions to speed up the page load time of a particular page. And some of the culprits that you want to look at are making sure you have images uh, that are of good quality but also not a lot in size. You want to make sure they're optimized. You want to look at your server response time. You want to make sure you optimize code. So there's a lot of different factors with page load time. You just want to keep an eye on what pages are, are not loading quick enough. And remember, we want to keep it as low as possible, but no more than three to four seconds. We talked about internal linking. Internal linking to a particular page from one page to another provides link juice. And link juice is nothing more than an indicator for the search engines to identify what pages tend to be more important than another based on the number of links pointing to that page. And then we also talked about sitemaps. So we talked about the two types of sitemaps html and xml html is for the end user xml is primarily for the search engines xml generally is going to be a file called sitemap.xml and we could take that xml file and submit it to google search console and so that expedites the process of indexing your site and helps your site not only get indexed faster but will help google understand how many pages are on your site and then get those pages indexed so that they can be found so that you can generate traffic. So all of these are factors with on-page SEO that you want to address before you move on to off-page SEO. Okay, let's um, turn our attention to off-page SEO. Now that we covered all the essentials for on-page, we still need to focus our attention on off-page. Remember earlier I mentioned that SEO is a two-pronged approach. We have to focus on on-page SEO first, and then to complement our efforts and to continue our efforts and to continue the effort of being relevant for certain keywords, we need to do what we call off-page SEO. And those are our actions we take that don't involve our website directly. Meaning we've already updated the title tag, the meta description, the alt tags, the headers, etc. We want to do things off our website that's going to allow Google and other search engines to recognize that, hey, we are relevant. These pages are relevant for certain keywords on our website. And so really when we talk about off-page SEO, it, it's really the technique of promoting your website using link building. And when we say technique of promoting our website using link building, that means establishing links on other websites. That's what we mean by link building. And so establishing links on other websites really enhances our SEO efforts because it improves, first and foremost, it improves the credibility of our website. So if we're on a, you know, a very popular website that is known to be reputable, then having a link pointing from that website to ours just improves the credibility of our own website. Not necessarily in the minds of the search engine, but in the minds of the end user. Uh, the other benefit here is it increases our domain authority. And let's take a minute to talk about domain authority. So domain authority is simply just a score between one and 100. And so in digital marketing, even including SEO as a marketing channel, everything's measurable. And we want to be able to measure everything we do digitally. And so off-page SEO is measurable. One of the metrics involved with off-page SEO is domain authority. In other words, it's a score between one and 100 for our domain. So how does Google, how does Baidu, how do these other search engines see our domain? 
How authoritative is our domain? How reputable is our domain? And so having links on other websites pointing to our domain increases our reputability, increases our authority. And so I'm going to show you an example. So if you remember back on on-page SEO, I, when we we're talking about keyword research, we used a tool called Moz, moz.com. And I would recommend using moz.com to measure domain authority. So if we go to moz.com, and moz.com has a tool called Link Explorer. So if you put in your domain using their tool, Link Explorer, you're gonna be able to see your domain authority. And domain authority is a score between one and 100. And, and basically it's simply just scoring your website in terms of authority. How does the search engine see your site out on the World Wide Web? The higher the score, the better. And so recommend using moz.com Link Explorer to measure the domain authority. So the more links we have on external sites pointing to our own site, in theory, the higher the domain authority. So we're going to come back to uh, moz.com quite frequently as we talk about off-page SEO because we need a tool to help manage our efforts. So we're going to come back to moz.com, but let's, let's talk about some of these other benefits to off-page SEO. So we know it helps with the credibility and increases our domain authority, but what are some of the other intangible efforts that are also measurable? Well, it increases our referral traffic and by increasing our referral traffic meaning if we're on a reputable site that gets a lot of traffic and there's a link pointing our site then naturally we're probably going to see traffic coming from that site and we can measure that in tools like google analytics we can measure referral traffic and so that's an inherent benefit to doing off-page SEO because we're trying to create the relevancy of our own website we're trying to be found for relevant keywords but yet at the same time, we can increase traffic to our website. And then certainly not lost in all this is improving our page rank. So the idea here is you need on-page and off-page SEO to work together to improve our rankings. And improving our rankings in the search engine results will inherently increase our rankings and drive traffic to the site from search engines. And that's ideally what we're trying to do. We're trying to accomplish traffic from search engines by improving our rankings. But at the same time, we improve our credibility and we improve our standing in the search engine world. And we also increase traffic to our site from all these other websites. And so there are a lot of benefits to off-page SEO. Um, it's just, let's talk a little bit more about some of these other benefits because According to a backlinko, a web page with more backlinks is going to rank higher than a page with fewer backlinks. But let me just say this, with backlinking, especially from sites, it's all about credibility. It's all about quality over quantity. So we want to pay attention to quality over quantity. So let's harken back to moz.com. And here we can see we have a domain authority of 35 but we have a lot of links, inbound links from other websites pointing to our website. We have 575 domains out there on the internet pointing to our domain, valleyfig.com. And so if we wanna take a specific look at these domains, we can just simply click on linking domains. And here we could see all the different domains pointing to our website. Now, again, it's about quality, not quantity. So if we look at the domain authority, and that's a score that measures the credibility of a website, we could see the domain authority on some of these domains, like npr.org has a domain authority of 93. And so to me, that helps boost the domain authority for our, our own website, our own domain. It also has the chance of driving that traffic. It also increases the credibility. But in the end, having quality links from other quality domains is going to increase our own rank on search engines. And that's the whole idea behind it. So we could actually see that we have quality websites and quality domains linking to our domain. Now, you can also use another tool. I mentioned this earlier with on-page SEO when I was talking about sitemaps. So if you go to Search Console, so that's a Google tool, we can also look at a link report and see what other websites are linking to us. So this is Google's way of communicating to us 
what websites are out there linking to us. And so here I can see the top linking sites to our website, valleyfig.com, is the Crumby Kitchen, has 1,443 links pointing back to our site. Cookscountry.com, Whole Foods Magazine, My Imperfect Kitchen, these are all sites with links pointing back to our site. So Search Console is a good tool. It's a good alternative tool, especially the links report. It's a good alternative tool to get an idea of the types of sites that are linking to your site. Now what you're missing here in Search Console is the domain authority, but you can use the Link Explorer tool in moz.com to measure the domain authority for any domain. It's just a matter of going to the tool itself, going by going to moz.com, by going to the Link Explorer report and just typing in the domain. And from there, you'll be able to see the domain authority. So it's all about quality over quantity. I can't stress that enough. So. When it comes to off-page, really, it's synonymous with link building. So it's the most effective method for off-page SEO. And it's simply just getting links from other websites to your own. So it's not as easy as it sounds, especially when we're talking about quality over quantity. But building these links to our website will help our rankings. And that's the whole idea behind off-page SEO. We want to be able to link from other websites to ours so that we can help our rankings in addition to some of the other benefits I just mentioned. So Google recognizes backlinks as one of their top ranking factors. So in addition to some of the on-page SEO tactics that I mentioned earlier, including title tag and meta description and URL structure and headers, all those are important. But at the same time, it's a balance. So Google wants to know, hey, yes, we understand you've optimized your title tag for a keyword, but how does the rest of the internet see your website? Are, is your website worthy enough to add a link from a particular quality website to your website? So if there are a number of quality links, then your site must be of quality as well. And so that's the whole idea behind link building being an important factor. Because again, it's about, from Google's perspective, it's about the user experience. They wanna make sure that sites ranked on page one of Google are quality sites. Quality sites that load well, that have good content, that have fresh content. Not just sites that have a gazillion links pointing to them with you know keywords stuffed into the title tag. So it's an ecosystem. Google's and other search engines wanna protect that ecosystem with quality. So that's why link building is an important factor. And so there are different types of links. So when you have a link pointing from one website to your own, okay, the link could be a follow link or no follow link. And the whole idea behind follow or no follow is simply, hey, we know that Google and other search engines are spidering the entire web. The whole idea is for them to collect as many pages as they, these search engines can to bring them back to their servers so they can serve them up in their search engines. Well, as Google and these other search engines spider these sites, they're following, what they're doing is they're following links. That's as simple as it gets. They're following links from one link to another. So remember we talked about internal links earlier on on-page SEO? Internal links are just links on your web pages pointing to other pages on your own website. Well, when it comes to external links, so links pointing from one website to your website, that website that's linking to your website has an opportunity to say, hey Google, you can follow this link or don't follow the link. And so if they choose to not follow the link, meaning they put a no follow tag into the anchor text, then Google's going to follow the link but not recognize the link itself. And what I mean by that is, hey, if you have, uh, let's just use Valley Fig, has a link from Wikipedia. If Wikipedia has a link pointing to valleyfig.com but the link itself is no follow, then what Google's gonna do is not recognize the link itself. They're not gonna recognize the link so therefore you're not gonna get credit or link juice as we say you're not gonna get any juice from Wikipedia to Valley Fig. But if it is a follow link, then what Google's gonna do is recognize the link and give you credit for the backlink. And by giving you credit for the backlink, that's going to inherently increase your domain authority. 
it's also going to likely increase your rankings. So you want to pay attention to the types of link building that's out there, no follow. And so anytime you try to establish a link on an external website, just make sure it's a follow. Make sure it's not a no follow because if it's a no follow link then you're not going to get the credit from the search engines and so the whole idea behind link building in terms of seo is to get some credit from a quality website to your website and so if we look here a follow link in this example is one where the href or the link itself doesn't have a no follow in it but if a hyperlink does have a no follow in it then that means you're not going to get the credit for the backlink so remember no follows they don't allow search engine crawlers to follow the link so if that's the case it's not going to pass any link juice when you don't pass quote unquote link juice you're not going to get credit for the backlink and so if you don't get credit for the backlink then if we go back to our tools that we have available for measuring off-page seo so if i go back to let's just say moz or even let's just say search console you know i'll be able to see all these links here these links that are showing up are follow links why because google's recognizing the link if they were no follow then we wouldn't see the link in here so that's something to keep in mind as well and so just keep in mind if it is a no follow you'll see in the hypertext itself the no follow tag and you can always check that the html of any particular link and so when we talk about link building we talk about off-page seo really we're talking about how to get links on quality websites. And how do we do that? Well, I've listed here a few ways to do that. So you could do guest blogging or blogging in general is a good off-page SEO slash link building strategy. And I'll talk about more of that in a minute. But we can list our websites in reputable and trustworthy directories. I mentioned Wikipedia as an example, even though Wikipedia may not be classified as a directory but there are other directories out there. You could ask for testimonials. So if you're working with clients or other websites, you could ask for a testimonial or they can provide a, a link pointing back from their site to your site. It's about relationships really is what it comes down to. It's relationship building. And that's what a link is, relationship building. Or you could do content on social media. So these are just examples of ways to generate links but let's go back to the blogging part because blogging to me is an essential part to off-page seo and why is that because anytime you are part of a blog you're generating content and not only are you generating content you're generating fresh content that's likely to be interesting to the end user and with that content yes you can optimize that content but the beauty about blogging is really anybody can do it but if we want to connect blogging with relationships, if we're a food blogger, then we can write on other food blogs as a guest writer. And we can have that blog post linked back to our own blog, as an example. Or we can have other bloggers in the same industry write a guest blog for us on their own blog and point their link back to our site. Blogging creates a lot of opportunities for link building. Because again, it's a fresh canvas with interesting content and when you have interesting content then the opportunity for backlinking is going to be there because if you're writing about something that's interesting then naturally you're going to want to link to something else related to that that's interesting and so that's the opportunity that blogging creates so again it's vital to get links from authoritative web pages then multiple links from low quality web pages so going back to the link explorer report we want to be able to pay attention to those domain authorities or those websites with low domain authority. And really you should pay attention to really quality sites. Okay. You want to pay attention to quality sites. And so when we talk about links, there's inbound links, there's outbound links. We're interested in those inbound links. We're interested in getting links from high quality websites pointing to our own website. And again, that could be in the form of a blog. It could be social media. It could be a partner site. Okay, these are all inbound links. They just need to be followed. Make sure they're not a no follow. So it's simple just getting an external link that's a follow to your 
to your own website. And so the one thing I want to mention here though on inbound links from external websites and that's making sure that not necessarily every inbound link points to the home page. We want to be able to have links point to internal pages. So let's harken back to Search Console as an example. So Search Console, our links report shows us links pointing from external websites to our own website. But what are those link pages? So if we look at some of those link pages here, we can see the top link pages. We can see on valleyfig.com slash recipes is the top link page. Then the home page, then the about us, then slash international. So we want to make sure that if we're trying to generate backlinks from external websites to our own website, we want to make sure that they're pointing to interior pages, not necessarily the home page. And why do I say that? Because one of the benefits to link building and off page SEO is ranking. So the whole idea about ranking is to get some of our other pages ranked, not necessarily the home page. The home page is just a doorway into your website. If we have interesting content out there on the web and it's a food blogger as an example and they're talking about a particular food item, well, they're going to want to link to a page that's related to what they're blogging about, that particular food item. They don't want to link to the home page. The home page is just a doorway. And so that's the whole idea behind link building. We want to link to multiple pages on the site. Why is that? Because if I take this particular page, valleyfig.com slash recipes, and I just put that into Moz, and I look at the Link Explorer report for this particular page, the domain authority is still going to be the same, 35. That's what valleyfig.com is, 35. However, there's also another metric called page authority. So page authority is likewise with the domain authority, it's a score between 1 and 100. And so the more external links pointing to an internal page with high domain authority, that's likely going to increase the page authority of that page. So in other words, if we have good links from other websites pointing to that page, then it's going to increase the page authority for that page and ultimately the domain authority for that page. And so just like the domain authority, in this case, Valley Fig, every page under that domain has a page authority score. So the higher the score, the likelihood that that page is going to rank in the search engine results. Okay, so that's the whole idea behind link building is we want to improve the authority of the pages, not just the domain. But also more importantly, we also want to keep the end user in mind. So if it's from a blog or social media, the link pointing from that blog or social media platform should naturally point to something related to what you're talking about not just the home page because again the home page more or less is the gateway into the website so we want to get people to where they want to go we want to naturally create a link from good content to some other good content so that's the whole idea behind backlinking so outbound links will direct a user from our own website to another website so the idea here is it's okay to have outbound links on your own website. It's the natural ecosystem of the World Wide Web, okay? What I would recommend here is not to have so many in a century located place. For example, don't have one page with nothing but external links on it. You know, sprinkle these external links, these outbound links throughout your website. But also, if it's not a reciprocal link, meaning if a guest blogger is not linking to your website, but you're just linking to theirs and they didn't ask you to, then maybe consider a no follow tag. Maybe, you know, ideally you want to make sure that these links are just natural in nature. So don't just have a habit of putting outbound links because the whole idea behind outbound links is you want to keep people on your website. But if it's a natural link going from one content to another and you think the end user is going to benefit, then no problem. But just don't get in the habit of putting external links on your website because that means that, hey, that user that's on your website may click on that link and leave your website and not come back. So keep that in mind as well because you don't necessarily benefit from an SEO perspective by having outbound links on your own website. You want to do it as a courtesy if somebody else is linking to you. You want to do it for the end user if you feel the benefit from additional content on another website. But from an SEO perspective, it doesn't necessarily directly enhance 
your own website in terms of ranking. Let's turn our attention to duplicate content. So a lot of us have websites with a lot of content. Sometimes we go ahead and take our website and revise it, create a new one, or register a new domain and put content on that new domain. And so we may find ourselves in a situation at one point or the other where we have two websites with the same content. Or it could be the same website with a lot of content, but some of that may be duplicate as well. So we want to try and stay away from duplicate content, but for some of us, we may stumble across it accidentally. We may find ourselves having content that's duplicated. And so we want to try and prevent that because that's a no-no in the world of SEO. So if we have duplicate content appearing in more than one URL, there are ways to rectify not having the search engines recognize the content twice. So some examples of duplicate content are, for example, a spammer takes an article and posts the same content on his website. Or like I mentioned before, you create another website or register another domain and have that particular content on the old website still. Or you're writing a blog post and you tag it or categorize it. And the content shows up under the tags under the categories and just shows up in general. So there are a lot of scenarios where you can find yourselves with duplicate content. And so we want to rectify that. We don't want duplicate content. We want the search engines to recognize the original source of the content. And so basically if you have two versions of a web page, you may result in duplicate content issues. Another example of that would be, for example, if you have products, you may find that that same product may be under two different categories. So how do we rectify that? Well, there are a number of different ways. And so the simple way is what they call a 301 redirect to the original URL. So if you find yourself in a situation where like, you have a new website with the same content, you could simply set up a redirect and we call it a 301 redirect because 301 refers to permanent. So it's signifying to the search engines that you're permanently moving from this page to this page. The other way is through a canonical attribute. And so the word canonical may not register with some of you. So let's just uh, take a minute to talk about what a canonical is. Like basically a canonical tag. It's a page level meta tag. So remember that meta tag description we talked about in on-page SEO? Well, think about this as another type of meta tag and it's placed in that HTML header of your web page. So basically all it does is by placing this meta tag, it tells the search engines which URL is the original version to be displayed in index. So it's the purpose of a canonical is to keep the duplicate content out of the search engine index. So we wanna consolidate our page rank, our page authority, our domain authority, all to original content. That's the whole idea of having a canonical and it's a quick solution. So all you need to do is add a canonical tag to the header. So let me show you an example. If you have a, a site, let's just use CNN as an example. CNN.com has a lot of content. And sometimes given the breadth of content that they have, they may run into duplicate content. So they simply just put a canonical tag into their, their header. And so by doing that, they're able to tell the search engines, hey, this page, this domain is the original. If you find yourself with multiple sites, well, you can also use Google Search Console. So remember, we used Google Search Console in earlier examples when we talked about links to your site or we talked about that site map on on-page SEO. Well, if we go on a Search Console, we could basically say, look, Google, because Search Console is a Google tool, we want to confirm that this is our domain. So this is the domain you should be focusing on. So you can leverage Search Console to communicate with Google regarding which site is important, which is the one that should get indexed. You can use a canonical, you can put that on any page of your website, or you can set up a 301 redirect. So those are the ways to fix duplicate content issues. 301s are the easiest. Canonicals tend to be temporary because they're just the page level 
And then Search Console is a, a good method because it communicates with Google directly. And it allows Google to crawl various web pages differently than if you didn't tell them. Okay, so if you didn't tell them, they're just gonna grab anything they can. So by communicating via the Google Search Console tool, it allows you to tell Google, this is the domain I wanna focus in on. So let's talk then now about how the Google algorithms work. So we'll shift gears here and we'll talk about how these algorithms work on Google. So Google uses advanced concepts, retrieve data. So what they do is they're spidering, they're spidering, they're collecting web pages and they're taking all those web pages back to their server. And anytime somebody does a query, they're delivering those web pages within milliseconds. They're delivering results based on your query. So that's in general how it works. So it uses a combination of different algorithms to deliver the best results. They want the best results. And so some of the most popular algorithms below are Google Panda, Google Penguin, and Google Rank Brain. So these are all things that Google has done to make sure that they're constantly tweaking their search engines to deliver the best results. So let's talk about some of these, these popular algorithms. And uh, before we talk about these popular algorithms, uh, let's just make one thing clear that Google's always tweaking their algorithms on their search engine. And so if you wanna get an idea how often they do it, well, they do it every day. They're constantly tweaking it, but they, what they do is they release major changes to their algorithm a few times a year. So if you wanna get a sense of what those changes look like, well, you could go to uh, moz.com and you can go to google-algorithm-change and you could see here that, hey, Google changes its search algorithm around 500 to 600 times. While most of these are minor, Google again rolls out major changes like Panda, like Penguin, that affects search results in significant ways. So you can go here and you can go all the way back to 2000 and see some of the algorithm changes that have occurred over the last few years. And you can see here, the last major one was done in August of 2018. That was the MediCore update. So they're constantly making changes to their search engine to deliver a more concise, more better ecosystem for the end user. So if it's a better search engine for the end user, end users are gonna come back. So the whole idea is continuing to tweak the system, the, the algorithms to better show more accurate results. And so let's take a look at some of the, the major algorithm changes that, that they've done in the past. So the first is we'll talk about Google Panda. And Panda was an algorithm that was released back in 2011. So here we are in 2019, it's a few years ago, but still significant in that really this algorithm emphasized high quality content. Because before Panda, there was a, there's just a lot of content out there on the internet and there was a lot of spam content, there's a lot of duplicate content. And so really the idea behind Panda is for Google to really deliver in their search engine results pages, high quality content. So what it did was it removed web pages that had low quality or duplicate content. So that was the whole idea behind, you know, the algorithm nickname Panda, it removed low quality and, and duplicate content. And that kind of cleaned things up a bit where if you did a search query now, you'd actually see better, better results. And one thing about Panda is because there's so much quality, because Google's indexing so much there on the internet that it's constantly being updated. It's updated regularly. So the next one we're gonna talk about is Google Penguin. So Penguin was released after Panda and what that focused in on was low quality links. So remember we talked about link building we talked about quality links over quantity. So naturally you're going to have links naturally from all websites, whether they be high quality or low quality. The whole idea behind this algorithm is to sever the links that are low quality. And so the idea behind that was they focused on two areas. So they focused in on link schemes and keyword stuffing. So that's what Penguin focused on was link schemes were basically 
link, almost link farming, where you produced mass amounts of backlinks. And not all of them were good quality. They weren't natural links. Links should be natural from one high quality site or blog to another high quality site or blog. And by creating links games, you've created an ecosystem where links just went to irrelevant, low quality spam related pages. And so Google's Penguin's algorithm update focused in on that effort to remove or combat pages that had poor links from being indexed in their search engine results. And then they also combated keyword stuffing. Keyword stuffing is nothing more than taking your targeted keyword and stuffing it into the content of your page, your title tag, your meta description. So any sites that were caught up doing that basically suffer the consequences because what Penguin did was take care of sites that basically were accused of keyword stuffing or had characteristics of keyword stuffing and they removed sites that had a lot of links pointing to it from poor quality sites and vice versa sites that really had a lot of external links pointing to other poor quality sites so that's what penguin did they took a look at those two areas and so if we talk about link schemes again penguin's aim was to decrease the ranking of web pages that created artificially by using black hat techniques. And basically what I mean by black hat techniques, that artificially creating link that just didn't make sense, just for the sake of getting the backlink, just for the sake of passing link juice. And so that's what a link scheme is or, or was. And so Google basically tweaked their algorithm to combat those poor link schemes. And so, Keyword stuffing, as I mentioned a minute ago, it's just repetitive usage of the same keyword. And that just basically suffers, the content is the thing that suffers here. And when the content suffers, the end user suffers. So Google is all about quality content. And when you have quality content and that quality content's indexed and users find what they're looking for, chances are they're gonna go back to the search engine to continue to find what they're looking for with the end result being presented with quality content. So keyword stuffing really dilutes the quality of the content. And then let's talk about the third algorithm, which is Rank Brain. So Rank Brain is a processing algorithm that uses machine learning. And what that does, that machine learning interprets search queries that users search on Google. So for example, if RankBrain sees a word or phrase it isn't familiar with, basically the machine can make a guess as to what words or phrases might have a similar meaning and filter the result accordingly. So basically take these search engine queries and present them in a way that's logical so that the end result can be something that's relevant to what you're looking for. And so for example, if you're searching for online marketing, you will get results related for digital marketing on search engine result pages. Why? Because Rank Brain will interpret that particular keyword. And they're trying to basically match based on all the data they collected what words or phrases might have a similar meaning. So online marketing, digital marketing have similar meanings. Now that we've talked about some of the different algorithm changes that Google has made over the years and continues to make, let's um, segue into the types of SEO. And so when we talk about the types of SEO, we're really talking about doing what's right, what's expected versus doing something that, you know, is trying to cheat the system. And so you may hear the terminology black hat SEO, white hat SEO, or gray hat SEO. And so the whole idea behind these terminologies is that, hey, what are we supposed to be doing here in terms of following best practices in order to get our pages ranked on the search engines for the keyword queries we covet? And so let's talk about what not to do first. And that's always black hat techniques. So I just mentioned a minute ago with Panda and Penguin algorithm updates, you know, Penguin took into account, you know, link schemes, poor linking techniques, keyword stuffing. So those are considered black hat techniques. So black hat is a technique used to improve page rank by violating search engine rules and policies. So it's clearly, Google's made a clear line in the sand. They don't like link schemes. They don't like keyword stuffing. So if you take into account those practices, then you're practicing black hat techniques to treat this, cheat the system to try and rank faster. And so 
some other ways of black cat or you know redirecting or phishing having duplicate content all these are are things that are frowned upon by search engines so the result of not only algorithm changes is you could get your website blacklisted from the search engines if you are caught in violation of their policies it's pretty clear cut so that's why the algorithms are in place uh the algorithms try and create a system and an environment where you know good quality content is shown so if you're keyword stuffing or creating lots of duplicate content that's not an adherence with you know google's policies for creating good quality content and as a result you could get blacklisted so with black hat techniques you run the risk of being penalized and you don't want to be penalized by the search engines so white hat contrarily used to improve search engine rankings by following those rules and policies so in effect it's everything we talked about today from on-page seo to off-page seo doing the right thing with your content in terms of organizing the structure with headers creating very clear and concise meta descriptions submitting a site map all of those are white hat techniques addressing page load time using really relevant keywords naturally in your content and creating high quality content that's fresh and interesting for the end user. That's a white hat technique that's going to get you ranked higher and farther and with better benefits. So gray hat is just simply a combination of black and white. It's a practice of improving by following the policies, but they considered you know, ethically dubious. And so what I mean by that is, listen, you, you don't want to purchase links. You want links to come across naturally. You don't want to do excessive internal linking. You don't want to have a lot of links pointing to one page. It's not natural. So you want to be able to do things that are natural. You don't want to just take content from another site and claim it as your own. So you want to do things that are natural that's going to create a good experience for the user because if it's for the end user which it is then generally it's going to be good for the search engines and so let's talk about website architecture now so basically when i say website architecture what i mean is we want to give the search engines an idea of how our website's built so website architecture and the structure of websites important and so every website has a hierarchy it starts with the home page the home page is the top page it's the the domain it's where most people go to find other pages of your website and so generally you're going to have a scenario where you're going to have a home page with you know if you sell products multiple categories and in those categories you're going to have multiple products so the, generally that's how a web architecture flows. It flows from top down. And the reason for having a good website architecture is internal links are spread equally. So you wanna make sure again, not to apply a black hat method or a gray hat method of pointing all links to one page. You want links naturally to spread throughout your website because not just from an SEO benefit, but from an end user perspective, you want users to flow through your website naturally. So if you're planning on developing websites from an SEO perspective, you know, take these things in consideration. So we want to take into account the site architecture and navigation. We want to take into account the URL. Remember, we talked about URL structure and on-page SEO. The rule of thumb is if you can read it, the search engines will read it. So we want to keep it clear and concise and relevant to the content of that page. When we talk about responsive design, we're talking about multiple devices. So you don't build a website just for desktop especially when mobile is being used by a majority of the users around the world so you want to build a website that's both desktop friendly and mobile friendly we also want to take into account a robots text file and a robots text file is simply just a text file that allows the search engines to index certain pages it tells them what not to index and so you can always find the robots text file normally if you go to a website uh, let's just say we go to valleyfig.com and then we type in robot or robots.txt file. Here we could see if I type in robots.txt file, here this basically is a file, a text file that's in the root directory, and it's simply just 
gives the search engines an idea of what they're allowed to index and what they're not allowed to index. So anything with a disallow means, hey, search engines, please don't index these pages. So that's what a robots text file does. And every site should have it because there are some pages on your website that you inherently don't want the search engines to index. And you want to optimize for the crawlers. So that means that making sure that your pages are available. And that means also submitting a site map. Remember, we submit our site map via the Google Search Console. So good site architecture not only makes content easy to find, but also helps to gain traffic because, hey, if your site is easy, it's well organized, it's built multiple devices, the URLs are easy, then all that's gonna be apparent to the search engines. And when it's apparent to the search engines, it's gonna get indexed. And when it get indexed, then you're gonna get found and you're gonna get the traffic. So it's just a natural progression. It's best practice. So some important features of good architecture are, again, that URL structure code your site navigation in css or html make it easy for the search engines to follow build a comprehensive structure for an internal linking meaning they should be natural internal links if a page is relevant to another page then create an internal link if you have a very big website with a lot of content or a lot of products then create a breadcrumb navigation okay so we're may be familiar with that on amazon as an example amazon Dot com has a lot of products and if you're navigating from one product to another in one directory or one category to another category then Amazon creates what they call breadcrumbs to help you navigate back to where you were quickly so these are all good best practices for good site architecture good site architecture equals search engine results so responsive design helps to make your mo website mobile friendly it will increase the amount of time the user spends on your website, which may improve site ranking. So let's talk a second about mobile friendliness. So if I go back to Google Search Console, there happens to be in Search Console a mobile usability report. And so if I click on that report, basically what it's going to show me is pages that are do not follow Google's best practices. So some of Google's best practices are making sure that the text is easy to read, that clickable elements aren't necessarily close to one another, and the viewport is set to the appropriate device, meaning the screen is set to the appropriate device, okay? And so basically, if we are found in violation, then the pages affected are going to get flagged by Google. And if the pages affected are flagged by Google, then those pages won't get indexed. And so we want to keep an eye on the mobile usability report in Google Search Console. So remember, it's better to have a good site architecture that bots can easily index. So bots will give preference to web pages with relevant content. And in the end, it will help your website rank better. And as a side note, always use a sitemap to make it easy for the bots to crawl your website. So we covered that in on page as a reminder. If I go back to Search Console, and if I click on sitemaps, I can go ahead and submit my sitemap. So if I created an XML version of my sitemap called sitemap.xml and I submit that, basically what I'm doing is I'm saying, hey Google, here's my sitemap file. And in that sitemap file are all the pages on my website that want to get indexed. And when you submit your sitemap to Google, Basically, they're going to discover those URLs and index those URLs in their search index. And that expedites the process of getting indexed. It expedites the process of getting found on search. And it expedites the process of getting clicks on your search results pages and, and having that traffic go to your website where they can enjoy the user experience and convert. And remember, the robots text file is there to allow Google and other search engines to know what pages to crawl. So good website architecture, like for example, Amazon, they use breadcrumbs. They have a hierarchy in terms of, of categories. 
Okay, so you can see how it's evenly dispersed on the left side. On the right side, a poor website architecture is very slanted in one direction, a lot of internal links, no breadcrumbs, the navigation isn't very clear. So we wanna make sure things are simple and easy. So let's turn our attention to local SEO. So local SEO is for those businesses who focus on a specific market. It could be a whole state, like the state of Florida in the United States. It could be a specific city in a particular state, like Orlando, Florida, or Miami. It really depends on the business and who you are trying to attract and what geolocation you are trying to attract. So if you're trying to attract a segment of audience in a specific location, then local SEO should be in your sites uh, for optimization. And so when we talk about local SEO, we're really talking about optimizing your website to get traffic from a specific location. So that's what local SEO is. And the idea behind local SEO is to put your particular service or product or whatever it is you're offering to that particular geo market, that particular locale or that city or that state. So you want to put yourself in front of the right audience. That's the whole idea behind local SEO. And so if we focus it on Google, you know, local results are based on three factors. And this is according to Google. So it's based on relevancy. So if somebody's looking for a plumber and you happen to be a plumber in that particular locale or city or zip code, then chances of you getting found are gonna be great because of relevancy. And then distance. So where that person's located based on your address or where you're located has a role in how you display on local SEO. And then prominence. So prominence is also very important because you know, how prominent are you as a business? Are you getting a lot of reviews? Do you have a lot of different locations? Do you have all your photos and all your information posted? So prominence does play a bit of factor along with distance, along with relevancy on Google local SEO. So these factors combine to help find the best match for your search. So somebody typing in that plumber or say that Italian restaurant or any particular product or service is going to find local results and you want to be there to to meet that person when they're looking for your product or service so that's the whole idea behind local SEO and so one of the factors with local SEO is having consistent NAP or NAP and so what is an IP it's really name address and phone number so it sounds very simple and it is simple you just have to be consistent so if you have a local SEO presence on say Bing search engine you want to make sure that the name address and phone number are can also the same name and address and phone number on Google so it's just about consistency so that's what we want to do we want to make sure that we're consistent across the board because it's important for companies that want to rank well have some consistency and it's important too when we talk about consistency to actually have that information you need obviously the name of your company you obviously need a phone number and you need to put your address in there but really of all three the phone number is just as important because when we talk about local SEO we mentioned mobile earlier we know that a lot of people initiate their search on mobile and so if they're looking for a local restaurant or a local cafe or that plumber and you appear in local SEO then your phone number is going to appear with the results and that gives an opportunity for somebody to go ahead and just click on that number to call it just makes it that much easier for somebody to get in touch with you so consistency and having all your information are important factors for local SEO so having an inconsistent nap if you will is not going to bode well for you on the local SEO results. Okay. It's important because it offers up legitimacy, it offers up better rankings, and at the end of the day, it's going to help you get those calls, it's going to help you get traffic to your website. So for example, if a particular company that sells Puma running shoes has a yellowpages.com listing, we want to be consistent. If it's on yellowpages.com and this is their address on their website, then you need to be consistent with that. If it's inconsistent and, and we're talking 
talking about very minor details, but these minor details are important. Simply just putting RD as road and then spelling out road is going to cause some inconsistency. So consistency is very important. Why? Because local SEO is also tied to mapping, you know, Google Maps. And so Google wants to see consistency so that they can offer up the address in the mapping services. So that's one good reason why it needs to be consistent. Another reason is, again, you know, so many may want to uh, drive to your location or call your location or see if that location is close to them. So that's why consistency is such a key component to local SEO. So in order to get started on Google for local SEO, what you want to do is you want to just do a search for Google My Business. So Google My Business is the platform in which you're going to set up your local business. And once you set up your Google My Business account, whatever that account is, you want to make sure you have all the credible information in there. I can't stress that enough. You need to have that phone number, you need to have that address, it needs to be consistent. But with Google My Business, there's a lot of things you can do here. So you can manage reviews. So if you do have a location, you can go ahead and manage those reviews uh, that somebody puts in for your business. And so if it's a negative review, you definitely want to respond to that negative review. If it's a positive review, you definitely want to respond to that positive review. So you can manage reviews. You can upload photos. So photos is a big component. As we talked about with alt tags and images, you know, having these images help appear in the local SEO results. You can manage a lot of other things, your information, you can manage posts, you can offer up promotions. There's a lot of things you could do. You could set your business hours. So the more information you put in to Google My Business, the more information is gonna can be conveyed to the end user looking for your products and services. And Google My Business even goes as far as offering up the opportunity to have a website. So if you're a business that doesn't even have your own website, you can create a website right in Google My Business. And so the end result is this. If somebody's looking for, let's just say, lice removal in Orlando, let's just say your child comes home from school with some lice, you need services that offer up lice removal. Well, you're going to be able to see businesses listed in the Orlando region that offer up the service you're looking for. And if you're on a mobile phone, you can go ahead and quickly, you know, call that person, you can go to the website, you look at the reviews. So local SEO is a very important to local businesses, very important. And so you want to make sure you have consistent presence, not just on Google, but on Bing and some of these other local platforms like yellowpages.com for example so being prominent across multiple platforms is going to put yourself in front of the right audience who's looking for your products and services let's talk about how to measure your SEO performance so all that hard work you've done with on-page SEO in coupled with all the work you've done with off-page SEO are eventually gonna net results and positive results. And we wanna be able to measure that as you're actually doing the work, as you're putting forth the effort on on-page and off-page. And so we wanna be able to measure that. And so you wanna be able to understand what to measure and where to measure it. And so when we talk about SEO, we really wanna hone in on three high-level core metrics, and that's ranking, traffic, and conversion. So when we talk about ranking, traffic, and conversion, we can break that down into this list here. What kind of traffic are we getting from organic search? What kind of traffic are we getting from mobile devices? Remember, mobile is very important because as we talked about with on-page SEO, as we talked about with local SEO, a lot of searches start with mobile devices. We wanna look at keyword ranking. Remember, keyword research is the first step in the SEO process, even before we do any work with on-page and off-page. You know, we want to look at the local visibility if we have local SEO results. We want to look at engagement metrics. So all that traffic we're driving from organic search, we want to be able to measure how they're performing and behaving on our website. We also want to measure some form of progress on off-page SEO and that's in the form of backlinks. So all of these are different metrics we can measure using different tools. So let's talk about how to go about looking at these metrics and where to go look at them and measure them. And so 
really monitoring all this behavior will help us understand how we're performing, how SEO is performing. And so really what we want to do is start with organic traffic. And so we can look at that on a month to month basis. We can look at it from a geographic perspective. We can look at it in terms of how many new visitors we're driving versus returning. And then again, more importantly, conversion rate. And so to me, the best place to start to look at that traffic from organic search is Google Analytics. And Google Analytics is a free tool. It's simply there to measure website performance. So if you go into Google Analytics, we can actually go in and we can look at all sorts of data based on website behavior. And so if I'm in Google Analytics and I go under acquisition and then I go under all traffic channels over a given period of time, let's just say the last seven days for a particular website, I can see what traffic is coming from organic search. And then I could see the amount of new users that are coming from organic search. I can also see engagement metrics, bounce rate, for example. So I want to be able to see if somebody's typing in a query, clicking on our link in the organic search results, and then coming to our website, are they actually engaging with our website or are they leaving the website after only visiting the page they landed on? So that's all in, these are all important metrics to measure. And I can measure all that right here in Google Analytics. If I wanted to, I can even take it a step further and break that down by country. So if I type in country as a secondary dimension, now I can see what country is driving traffic from organic search. So a lot of your organic traffic information is going to be centrally located in Google Analytics. So we also talked about mobile traffic. A majority of searches take place on mobile phones versus desktop. So Google basically is reporting that nearly 60% of searches now appear from mobile devices. And so if we go back to Google Analytics, we can also look at a mobile report. So if I go in Google Analytics under audience, under mobile overview, I can see a breakdown of the amount of traffic coming from desktop versus tablet versus mobile. And so you'll find as time goes on that your mobile device is likely going to drive a majority of the traffic from organic search. And so you can compare device information with channel. So if I just type in channel in Google Analytics as a secondary dimension and look at the default channel groupings versus device category, I could see that you know mobile from organic search is driven traffic over the last seven days. This is something you want to keep an eye on because a lot of people tend to begin their searches on mobile devices. So mobile ranking is different than desktop ranking because with mobile ranking, it's based on a responsive website. And with that responsive website, basically responsive being that the website's going to adapt to the mobile device. So it's going to respond to the device that somebody's on. And so therefore the metrics or the engagement metrics are going to be different. But if I look back to Google Analytics, I can see again, bounce rate. I can see pages per session, average session duration. So if I look at line three, I could see all the different engagement metrics compared to those metrics from other devices and other channels. Okay. So you want to be able to do a comparison because if, behavior is not up to par, engagement is not up to par on mobile, then you want to do something about that. So you want to hone in on mobile traffic specifically from organic search because the behavior is going to be different. You know, people start their searches on mobile, the site's going to be different. And so therefore it's a different experience altogether. So make sure you track the behavior and more importantly, make sure you track that page speed. So earlier we talked about on page SEO when we honed in on page speed. So just as a reminder, if I'm back in analytics and I go back under behavior, then if I go to site speed, then if I go to overview, I'll be able to see the average page load time on my website. I can also look at specific page timings and I should be able to see that by device. So if I type in device category, I'll be able to see how each page loads per device. And so this allow me to understand 
which pages are loading fast, which pages are not loading as fast, and address those pages accordingly to improve engagement metrics. So we wanna keep an eye on page speed as well as overall user behavior from mobile devices. You can also use other tools that are out there like agency analytics. There are plenty of tools out there. I tend to use Google Analytics because primarily it's free and Google Analytics is a Google product so it works with other Google platforms like Google Search Console. We want to keep an eye on ranking. So remember when we do our keyword research, we're choosing keywords that have high relevancy, high volume, and low competition. So we want to be able to track keywords that we choose that have high relevancy, high volume, and low competition. And so the tool we use, or at least I recommend using is Moz. So I mentioned Moz earlier with on-page and off-page SEO. So if we go into Moz and we know what keywords we're trying to rank for, we can go ahead and add them to Moz. And what Moz does, they actually track where these keywords rank. And so if I go into Moz and I click on rankings, I'll be able to see on a weekly basis or a monthly basis, how our keywords are ranking and for what pages they're ranking. So for whatever keyword I choose to, to optimize for, I want to make sure I put those keywords in Moz because when I put them in Moz, Moz is going to, on a weekly basis, tell me where these keywords rank and for what URL they're ranked for. So that way I can keep an eye on ranking over time because in theory, the higher you rank, the more traffic you're going to get. And so we want to be able to see the trend in which keywords rank. Okay, so if I click on a particular keyword in Moz, it's going to give me over a period of time where that keyword's ranked. Be able to see improvement in ranking for a particular keyword. The whole idea behind SEO is to choose keywords that are relevant, optimize for those keywords so that you can be ranked for those keywords in order to get the traffic and conversions. So Moz is a good platform that helps us monitor rankings for particular keywords. Now, if you don't want to use Moz, as an alternative, you can turn your attention to Google Search Console. And so remember, we talked about Google Search Console earlier when we talked about sitemaps. We also talked about mobile usability with Search Console. We also talked about links to your site with Google Search Console. So Google Search Console is a good tool to help you understand how you're performing with organic search. And so there's one tool in particular, which is performance, that helps us understand what keyword queries people are actually typing into Google search. And so here I can see the actual query. And so with this particular website, valleyfig.com, I can see that dried fig recipes over the course of the last three months had 5,414 impressions. That means that one of my pages, either one or multiple pages, appeared in Google search engine results. 5,414 times. And over the course of those 5,414 impressions, I received 1,100 clicks. So Google Search Console is gonna be able to tell me not only you know how many impressions I received for a particular keyword, but they also are gonna tell me how many clicks. And if I wanted to add more metrics to that, I can add them, like the average ranking position for a keyword, the click-through rate, so I can add multiple metrics to this report to give me an understanding of, hey, are any of my targeted keywords being used or queried? And if they are, where am I ranking? And I, am I showing up? And am I getting clicks? So Search Console serves as a good alternative, if not primary tool or platform for you to measure how your organic search results are showing. So for local visibility, this metric is important for you know, maintaining local SEO. So remember on the local SEO, we talked about uh, Google My Business. So if I go back to Google My Business, I can go into my account. And so Google My Business is going to be able to show me some metrics. So if I go into Google My Business and I click on Insights, I'm going to be able to see a number of different metrics. Over the course of a month, I can see exactly, you know, what queries were used by how many users and when I appeared. So I'll be able to see how many views I received, not only on search results, but on maps. Then I can also see what actions people took when they saw my results in maps or on search. Did they visit my website? Did they request directions? Did they call? So I can actually see engagement metrics right in Google My Business. 
I could see a breakout by zip code. I could see phone calls by day of the week. I could see how many people even viewed my photos. So there's a lot of insights into local SEO on Google My Business. So that gives you an idea of how you're performing organically on local search. And remember, you wanna be able to use Google My Business to hone in on your specific audience. So all these metrics help you align with whether you're getting in front of the right audience and whether that audience is actually behaving the way you want them to. Meaning, you know, are they actually contacting you? Are they going to your website? Are they calling you? So local visibility and understanding the metrics involved with local SEO is very important. So Google My Business is where you wanna turn your attention attention. So overall engagement metrics are important. They play an important role in determining rankings. For example, we talk about bounce rate. So bounce rate is the rate at which people go from organic search to your website and then leave after uh, seeing one page and not going any further. So if they land on a page and then leave the website after landing on that page, it's considered a bounce. And so bounce or bounce rate is a good indication of how people are receiving our website or the content that they're reading on our website. There are other metrics involved like average session duration or pages per visit. All of these are engagement metrics. And let's not forget about page speed. So page speed is also a good engagement metric. All of these metrics affect or determine rankings. So we want to be able to make sure that if we're in Google Analytics and we're looking at engagement metrics, that our metrics are good. Because if somebody comes to our website from organic search and there's a high bounce rate, then what does that tell us? That there's a disconnect between what that person's querying and then the content that they're reading. And so we wanna be able to address those engagement metrics so that we can continue to not only drive quality traffic, but keep the traffic engaged and then in turn drive up conversions. Last metric we wanna look at is backlinks. So content having more backlinks from good domains will effectively improve your SEO performance. We talk about backlinks with off-page SEO and remember, quality over quantity. And so we can measure backlinks going back into Moz. We can use Moz's Link Explorer tool. So remember, if I type in a domain, Valley Fig, I can get some metrics related to off-page SEO, including my domain authority. But more importantly, I can see what links are pointing to my site, in this case, valleyfig.com. So I can see there are 575 link domains. I can see there are 7,900 inbound links. And so just by clicking on that, I can get an idea of the types of websites that are linking to my site and their domain authority and, and their spam score, Google Search Console. So if you go back into Search Console, you can also just click on links and we should be able to get an idea of, you know, what websites are linking to our site. And more importantly, we want to be able to see not only what sites, but what pages they're linked to. Remember, we want our backlinks pointing to interior pages, not necessarily the home page. So here I can see the top link page for valleyfig.com is slash recipes. So we want links pointing to our interior pages, not necessarily the home page. That's what's gonna help your performance, your rankings for all your pages, not just your home page. So having quality back links pointing to interior pages help boost the domain authority and the page authority for that particular page. So again, using Moz, Link Explorer tool, or using the Links Report and Search Console are good sources for you to identify backlinks. So when we look at these, these reports, we wanna look at the domain authority of these sites that are linking ours, the number of outbound links to the site or specific pages on our site. We wanna be able to look at the ratio of link distribution. You know, we wanna be able to look at how many follows and no follows. So most of this, if not all of these metrics are in Moz. So if I go back to Moz, I can actually see, you know, which ones pointing, which ones are followed, the total quality, 
functionality of the link that's pointing to our site. Again, bam. So Moz Link Explorer report tends to give us all the information we need in order to measure and get a sense of our backlinks that help us with off-page SEO. So there are other tools out there. There's Ahrefs, again, Search Console. There's other SEO platforms out there that'll help you measure backlinks. Okay, now that we covered everything with on-page SEO and off-page SEO and really everything SEO in general, let's take a little quiz. And if you could, go ahead and just put your answers in the comment section below. So just a little quiz here and we'll start out with question one. Which of the following type of site map is specifically designed for search spiders? So the answer is either A, HTML site map, or B, XML site map. So go ahead and put your answers in the comment section below. I'll give you just another second to think about that. Okay, another question for you. From a search engine perspective, which of the following link types could cause a negative effect on your rankings? It's either A, purchase link, or B, no follow link. So again, if you could, if you know the answer, or just take an educated guess, go ahead and put the answers in the comment section below. Okay, next question. A website's robots text file serves what function? Is it A, tell the bots what pages should be crawled and not crawled? Or B, tells the bots what links should be follow and no follow? So if you know the answer, you feel good about your answer, go ahead and put it in the comment section below. Okay, let's do a recap on some of the key takeaways from today's uh, session about uh, SEO. So we started out with why SEO and why do we want to take part and put some time and effort into search engine optimization? If you recall, one of the biggest factors was it increases visibility on search engines. So if you're not getting any traffic to your website, if you don't have any other marketing channels that you're currently working on, such as social or blogging or paid search, then SEO will definitely help increase your visibility then we moved over to what is SEO so we talked a lot about you know not only the benefits of SEO but what's involved with practicing search engine optimization and we know it's the practice of getting traffic from organic search from really any search engine we honed in today on Google but really when it comes to SEO, it's every search engine. So we want to be able to be relevant for certain keyword queries on the search engines. We focused our attention on to keyword research. So we talked about what's involved with keyword research. We talked about short tail keywords. Remember, short tail keywords are three keywords or less. Longer tail keywords are three keywords or more. And really, when it comes to short tail keywords, they're generally broad in nature. They have high search volume, but they're very competitive because they're broad in nature. And the conversion rates tend to be a little bit lower because of the relevancy factor. However, if you focus in on longer tail keywords, if you recall, generally, they're longer in nature low volume however if somebody types in a longer tail keyword and you rank for that long tail keyword chances are it's going to be a little bit more relevant for the end user so when they actually click on your link in the search engine results and go to your website your conversion rate increases so it's a balance between short tail and long tail we then transition to how search engines work remember search engines send out bots to your website they want to crawl your website Website. and by crawling what they do is they follow links okay they follow internal links and external links so in effect when they're following links they're creating a sort of a web if you will so that's where we get the term spidering from. They're, they're spinning a web on all these links that they're following. And what they do is when they follow, they're really collecting. And they're collecting all that content and bringing it back to their servers. Because when they bring the content back to their servers, when somebody actually does a search on the search engine, then the search engine itself is able to you know, spin results in milliseconds based on the relevancy of that qu keyword query. So that's in general 
how search engines work. Now that you have an idea of how search engines work and why you should do SEO and the importance of measuring long tail versus short tail keywords, we went into the actual practical application. And if you remember, it's a two pronged approach, on page SEO and off page SEO. So for on page SEO, it's everything that involves your website. So we talk about making changes or optimizing your website to be relevant for certain keywords. We went through a number of different factors. We talked about schema and title tags and header tags. If you remember, header tags had a hierarchy, H1 to H6. We talked about what a featured snippet is, you know, whether it was a list or a paragraph. We talked about the importance of page speed. Remember, you can look at page speed in Google Analytics. You want to be able to make sure your pages load between three to four seconds max because the longer it takes a page to load, the higher that bounce rate is going to be and the lower that conversion rate is going to be. We talked about the importance of internal linking and how you can measure internal linking in Search Console. And speaking of Search Console, we also made mention that you can upload a sitemap. So the HTML sitemap is for the end user. The XML sitemap is for the search engines. We can go ahead and take that XML sitemap and submit it to the search engine so that they can recognize all the pages on your website. So these are some of the key factors of on page and when you do on page then you transition over to off page SEO and off page SEO is really synonymous with link building and why do we do link building well we talked about some of the benefits it definitely improves the credibility of your website because if you have a link pointing from another credible website to yours then naturally the credibility is going to be there not only for the end user but for the search engine and as a result of being linked from quality websites or credible websites it's going to increase a metric called domain authority remember domain authority is a score between 1 and 100 and the higher domain authority the more relevant you're going to be in the eyes of the search engines in order to be relevant you need backlinks or external links from quality websites and because you have links from quality websites, the likelihood of you getting more traffic is going to increase. So one of the net benefits of getting backlinks is you're going to get traffic from those websites, especially if they're credible and they're popular and they get a lot of traffic themselves. And so all of this leads to off-page SEO, which is in turn what we wanna do is improve our page rank. So we wanna improve our rankings in the search engine results pages. And when we improve our rankings in the search engine results pages in effect we're going to get more traffic from search engines so off-page SEO is very critical that with on-page SEO balances out the relevancy factor and you want to be relevant in the eyes of the search engines for your targeted keywords we then shifted gears and we talked about some other factors along the lines of search engine optimization including duplicate content so search engines don't like duplicate content so if you recall we talked about ways to combat duplicate content we talked about setting up redirects we also talked about canonical tags remember canonical tags are tags we put in as a meta tag and that's going to alert the search engines hey this particular domain this particular page is the initial source pay attention to this page we talked about Google's algorithms and Google makes tweaks to their search engines every day and because they make tweaks to their search engines every day they're trying to find fine-tune it and usually you're gonna find that Google in particular is going to have one or two major algorithm changes once a year and so we talked about some of the key algorithm changes as Google's made over the last couple of years including Panda which took into account quality of content or Google Penguin which took into account link scheming Okay. So we want to stay away from link farming and you want to be able to create good quality content. So that's what these particular algorithms took into account. And then of course, Google Rank Brain, which basically is synonymous with machine learning. So Google's search engines are continuously learning what people type in as queries. And because they're learning what people type in, they're starting to form their search engine results based on what they've previously learned. So that's what 
rank brain is. It's synonymous with artificial intelligence or machine learning. And Google initiated rank brain back in 2015. So Google is constantly making changes to their search engines for the better. They want a more solid, more relevant set of results to improve the entire ecosystem of search. And some of the SEO techniques that we talked about in order to be relevant for certain keyword queries. And we talked about the techniques that you should apply. And those techniques are white hat techniques. So you want to be able to follow certain best practices. You want to stay away from black hat SEO or gray hat SEO. Black hat SEO, you know, are things that you would do to kind of circumvent best practices like link farming. So you want to take into account everything we talked about in today's tutorial because it follows the best practices. Not only Google, but all search engines. We talked about website architecture and how important that is for SEO. I think the key takeaways here is responsive design. Remember, mobile is very important in terms of organic search. In the eyes of Google, most users conduct or initiate their search on a mobile device. And so therefore, it's imperative that you, as a website owner, have a responsive design for your website, meaning that design caters to the device that somebody's going to your website with. So if it's a mobile device, the website should respond to the mobile device, meaning take into account best practices. We talked about having a consistent URL structure, having robots text file. So a robots text file is a file that allows the search engines to understand what pages to index and what pages not to index. We shifted gears and talked about local SEO. Local SEO is for those businesses that are targeting a specific market, whether that be a town, a locale, a municipality, a city, or a state. Local SEO is a, a strategy. And remember, the benefit of local SEO is is you appear above the organic search results. So if you're a local business catering to say people looking for plumbers, then you have the opportunity to be listed above organic search results. The one thing you need to do that we talked about was just be consistent with NAP, name, address, and phone number. And so if you're consistent with NAP and you take advantage of everything that Google My Business has to offer, then your chances of being found low locally are going to be good. And we capped everything off with measurement. So how to measure your SEO performance. This was last, but certainly not least. So we talked about specific metrics in terms of organic traffic, mobile traffic, backlinks, local visibility, keyword ranking. So some of the tools I mentioned in today's tutorial was Google Analytics. So Google Analytics is a free tool and it will help you measure the traffic you're getting from your website, from mobile, from organic search and you could pair that traffic against specific engagement metric like bounce rate like time on page or conversion or conversion rate okay so Google Analytics helps you understand how your visitors are behaving on your website from mobile organic search we talked about Google my business again because with Google my business they provide insights into how people are searching what search key keyword queries they're using and if you're being found for those search engine queries. And if you are found, what are people, what actions are people taking? Are they actually calling you? Are they looking for directions? Are they going to your website? So Google My Business has insights that provide information into your local visibility for SEO. We also mentioned Moz. Moz was a tool we mentioned throughout the tutorial. We used it in our keyword research. We used it in terms of talking about keyword ranking. We also used it in terms of off-page SEO. Remember, the Link Explorer tool will allow us to measure what our domain and page authority is and the quality of backlinks that we have. Okay, So Moz fills the role with keyword ranking and backlink. So we can get really good information in terms of, you know, what backlinks are hitting our site and the quality of those backlinks, but also keyword ranking. Remember, when we target certain keywords, we want to be able to allow Moz to track the rankings of these keywords, because in theory, the higher a keyword ranks, the more traffic you're going to get from the search engine. So Moz, Google My Business, Google Analytics were three of the main tools we talked about. There are plenty of other tools like SEMrush, 
Ahrefs. There's a lot of different tools out there that we mentioned that are available to you. So go ahead and use the tools that you feel comfortable with. These are the tools that I only mentioned that I'm comfortable with with SEO. So the key here is though, you need to measure performance. That's the key takeaway. So thank you for listening to today's tutorial. If you have any more information or any questions about SEO, visit simplylearn.com for more information. Thank you. Hi there. If you like this video, subscribe to the Simply Learn YouTube channel and click here to watch similar videos. To nerd up and get certified, click here.